Hello, friends, and welcome to Impact Everywhere, the podcast that looks for people having a positive impact in unexpected places. Today, I'm proud to introduce to you guys Royce Mann, an 18 year old youth activist and spoken word poet. Back when he was 13, he went massively viral with a piece called White Boy Privilege. And since then, he's been wrestling with the balance of fame and responsibility, as well as the privilege that he has as a white male in Atlanta, Georgia. I first heard Royce in Montana at a conference organized by a group called Hatch, and I was blown away by not only how amazing his performance was, but also the depths of knowledge that Royce pours into every single word and action that he uses and undertakes. Royce is extremely intelligent and pays a ton of attention to the nuances between activism and virtue signaling. And this week, I really wanted him to share a couple lessons that he's learned over the course of his brief but really exciting career. We tackle a number of different topics, including the responsibility of the visibility and privilege that we have, the way that we can best use our individual skills to further the causes that we believe in, how important it is for us to become aware of our complicity inside of the systems that we fight against, as well as finally, the power of conversation, word, and art. Before launching straight into the conversation though, I thought it would be most appropriate to share with you guys a brief snippet of white boy privilege just so you get a little bit of context around Royce and what launched him into stardom. Warning, the clip is not recorded professionally and it's a little bit old, so the sound is not quite the best, but it's just a minute and a half long. And if you can't stand it, you can just skip forward by a minute and a half. This is Royce Mann and here is his poem, White Boy Privilege. Dear women, I'm sorry. Dear black people, I'm sorry. Dear Asian Americans, dear Native Americans, dear immigrants who come here seeking a better life, I'm sorry. Dear everyone who isn't a middle or upper class white boy, I'm sorry. I have started life at the top of a ladder while you were born on the first drum. When I was born, I had a success story already written for me. You, you were given a pen and no paper. I've always felt that that's unfair, but I've never dared to speak up because I've been too scared. Dear white boys, I'm not sorry. I don't care if you think the feminists are taking over the world or the Black Lives Matter movement has gotten a little too strong because that's bull****. I get the change can be scary, but equality shouldn't be. Hey, white boys, it's time to act like a woman, to be strong and make a difference. It's time to let go of that fear. It's time to take that ladder and turn it into a bridge. So when white boy privilege went viral, it was this really sudden realization that there was this power in my words that even as I had people around me pointing it out, I still couldn't recognize. Everything that I was getting from the world was saying that what I had said, which seemed like this personal coming to terms with things that I'd been learning about in the classroom and discussing with family members, had some sort of greater purpose in the world. It was a really odd feeling, but also really empowering. It was sort of confusing in a lot of ways. And you also realize that it's not anything special about you. It's almost like I was just like let in on a secret that each of our voices is so much more powerful than we think it is. And if I hadn't been let into that secret accidentally by like going viral, then I wouldn't have the confidence or conviction or belief that my voice could make an impact and thus wouldn't try to use it in that way. You say that what you did wasn't special, but like, I mean, you got on every single major news channel on on the country, you went massively international. And so it resonated with people. Yeah. You are a vessel for this thing. So on one hand, you're saying it's not special because it's something that shouldn't need to be said. But on another, you brought to light clearly a lot of feelings that either people were having or were afraid to confront. And so I think there's something really special in that, though. In a way, but I wouldn't attribute it to anything that I did. I think that sort of getting to this idea of impact, I didn't write that poem to be seen by anybody other than my classmates. I was fine posting it afterwards, but that wasn't my intent at all. What if that same poem had been posted and just got 200 views and nothing happened? I mean, it was a matter of luck. It was a matter of privilege. 
there's this awful pattern that needs to be called out more of anytime white folks engage in a discussion about racial justice, it's seen as heroic in some way. Anytime a white person acknowledges their privilege or just does something of that sort, the attention always goes towards them. I think that the message that sends to any white person that is trying to be a genuine sort of ally is that it's about them. And that shouldn't be the messaging at all. And that can be negative reinforcement in a way. What's so funny to me is that it strikes me that you're just an exceedingly humble person, because in my case, as an Asian dude, I'm a visible minority. I've never had to question the color of my skin. I just went ahead and tried my best to accomplish things. But in your case, especially because the subjects that you tackle are these concepts of toxic masculinity and racial equity, it brings so much weight and history and awareness into the equation, like I can't, I don't even know how you built this level of awareness at the age of 14. Can you walk me through the journey of what it was like to go from discovering an injustice, finding a voice, being tossed into the spotlight, and then figuring out what to do with all of that attention? What kind of lessons did you learn along the way that you'd like to share with people? First thing that comes to mind, which is sort of the most recent lesson I've learned, is it's really important to acknowledge any and all selfish motivations in anything you do and to see and investigate if they align with your selfless motivations, the impact that you're trying to have on the world and for others. When we get into the space of telling ourselves that what we're doing is purely selfless, that's just a lie because I don't think that's how we operate as human beings. When we begin to see our own success as intertwined with that of our communities, then we're able to find and pursue work that we're passionate about that both brings us personal fulfillment and is furthering our goals for helping our communities. Ooh, that's a really, really good one. I particularly love that tiny little tip on how you tie your success to that of a community, which ensures that you never get lost inside of your own ego. Are there any other questions that you ask yourself in order to keep your ego in check? I think this is just one that would be helpful for me as well as everyone else listening. It's really about trying to visualize the impact that any action is going to have. In terms of questions, I really just try to ask myself over and over, why am I doing this? And then whatever the answer is to that, you want to ask, how does this help? get there. Assuming that answer is something good that's not, you know, I want to I want to become Instagram famous, then you just really need to make sure that your actions connect directly to that goal. I really like to just think about where I can plug myself in to be the most impactful. And so that's recognizing your own skills, being really aware of what you can offer and how you can be helpful but also taking feedback from others and making sure that you are filling a gap versus jumping in front of somebody else. Yeah, yeah, you have a really good point. I think there's this tendency and maybe just a byproduct of too many movies and stories out there of people just charging in and wanting to be the hero without necessarily knowing how they can contribute. And so I think taking the time to spend on personal introspection as well as studying the cause is a really critical piece of the process. So then throwing this question back at you and your unique skills as a spoken word activist, what did you do differently in the pieces following white boy privilege? One thing that ended up happening after white boy privilege, I had this poem called All Lives Matter that I performed on the show called The Preachers. And it was really focused on police brutality. It was soon after Eric Garner was murdered and Alton Sterling, and it paid homage to them. And while I agree with everything I said in that poem, the more that I reflected on it after having gone out and performed it on national TV, I just didn't feel that I was necessarily the right messenger for that because it wasn't bringing my own unique point of view. It was me appropriating messaging that I had learned and been taught by mainly educators, activists, leaders of color who had been out there amplifying this messaging for a long time, but for some reason when there was this young white voice that came and repeated basically the same stuff, just in, I guess, a fairly well-written poem, it got this other level of attention. And eventually I really decided that I wasn't going to perform that poem anymore, which is interesting because it's recently sort of like gone viral again. So I've been like getting tons of people sending it to me. 
telling me how much my words touch them. And, and I really appreciate that. It's good that those words are out in the world, but the most meaningful for me is videos on TikTok of young people of color, young black men, especially who really resonated with those words. And like some videos that I've seen of some black poets, like reciting that poem and even changing it up a little bit, which is something that I love because it, yes, they were my words, but it's a poem of solidarity. And when the people who I'm claiming to stand in solidarity are able to use those words in some way to amplify their own voice, that's the best use that that poem can have. Alrighty, I'm sure that everyone listening here is really curious about this All Lives Matter piece. So I went online and decided to plop it here for you guys. It's a minute and a half. And I'd invite you to pay attention to what Royce said stood out for him. It's the fact that this poem did not reference any of his personal experiences, but rather was a rehash of those of other leaders and other spokespersons and other activists. It'll provide you with a contrast to the next poem that we're going to be playing. Check it out. All lives matter, but one, so do black lives. Why do two phrases that should work side by side seem to only divide? Two, that's all anyone's saying. Black lives matter, too. Eleven, that's how many times I can't breathe, 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 I can't breathe. Eric Garner said, I can't breathe before he was killed by police. So I guess those three words only mean stop if you're white. 15, that's how old Cameron Sterling was when he lost his father. 15, that's how old Cameron Sterling was when he said we must protest the right way. 15, that's how old Cameron Sterling was when he said peace, not guns. 20, so why were 20 officers shot in retaliation when all that separates black and blue is only a few shades? 52. It's been 52 years since the Civil Rights Act passed and everyone supposedly became equal. Well, guess what? We're in 2016 and films about equality are still part of the fantasy genre. 102. That's how many unarmed black people were killed by police last year. One. One is one more than that number should have been. This, by the way, guys, is Royce when he was just 15 years old. And as you can hear, he didn't say anything particularly unique. He just said it as a white man. And so I wanted to ask him, what role does he believe that the white man has to play in the fight for racial equity? The role that I as a white male can play is talking to other white folks and having those honest conversations because I think that every person has internal biases based around race in some way, whether they want to admit it or not. But the only time they're going to feel comfortable really addressing those is in the presence of other white folks. It's just really about recognizing what audience you're going to have the most influence over. And that's oftentimes going to be people from your own community, most likely of your same race and socioeconomic status. I think what's great in your journey is that you're consistently challenging yourself to do better. And that commitment to doing better is something that maybe we all should embody a little bit more. I do want to ask you, though, because you keep adding more constraints to what you consider to be something worthy. So from needing to speak explicitly from your mm -hmm. own perspective, from a position of knowledge, from a position which isn't stepping on anyone's toes or taking away the limelight. At what point did you create a piece where you went like, oh yeah, this is the piece that I am proud of. This one's okay. Yeah, for now, for now. I'm sure you'll come up with other yeah. problems at some point, but for now, um, <laughs> what's the best thing you've done so far and why? Should I read a poem or? I'm down, yeah. If you're going to do a live, let's All do right. a live one just for Let fun. Pull it just up. for fun. Recently, I became a man. I didn't have a bar mitzvah. My dad didn't take me fishing or hunting. I didn't hit my first home run, grill my first hamburger, or have my first wet dream. But recently, I became a man. It happened the first time a woman avoided me on the sidewalk. I just had baseball practice, and I was walking to meet my mom at a restaurant when the woman 10 feet in front of me glanced back. 
I knew she was looking at me, but I had no idea what she was seeing. The separation between us was undeniable, but the distance wasn't enough. She changed direction, crossing the street like Moses did the Red Sea, trying biblically to find freedom from me? Her footsteps taught me the danger of my own hands, taught me what it truly means to be a man, though I may never know what it means to fear one. You know, in that moment, I finally understood Peter Pan. I wanted to stay a boy, not become a man, because a man, as I now knew, was a mix between a father, brother, and attacker, mostly the latter. I wonder... The first time a woman avoided him on the street. Did Brock Turner feel the same way? I mean, we can't be that alike. He was a star swimmer. In that moment, I was trying not to sink. But then again, you can't spell rapist without an I. And then again, there's two of you in sexual assault. But then again, it takes you and I to achieve a solution. You know... There is something in the air of a locker room that makes me feel sick. Something about hanging with the guys that makes my throat constrict. And it's not the body odor, it's the toxic masculinity. It has a distinct smell. A little something like the high school junior who grabs an ass every time he walks down the hallway, trying to colonize female bodies like his ancestors did these lands. He is fully aware of the power of his hands. It smells like emotions bottling up until they form bruises, like unsolicited dick pics. It has a distinct smell. It smells like a dugout, like the guys inside talking about girls the same way they do baseballs, telling each other to smash both. It smells like my baseball jersey used to, like punchline smile jokes. It smells like every time I didn't speak up. To the first woman who avoided me on the sidewalk, thank you and sorry. I should have crossed instead. And I want to let you know that the second time I did and the third as well, each time momentarily mistaking the cracked street for my own reflection and the other side for your safety, silly me, to my fellow boys, it is time that we cry cry for ourselves and for what we've done. It's time that we question our own innocence because Brock Turner wasn't born a rapist. When he was a kid, he played with girls on playgrounds. It wasn't until he grew older that he learned to treat girls like playgrounds for every student. There are many teachers. We must confront our own complicity. Then, only then will we truly be men. Wow. I love it every time you go into like slam poet mode. It's like, <laughs> boom, different human being. Just it's so powerful. I I want you to break it down though. Like, tell me what about this one worked for you? And maybe the harder part of that question is how did it move the needle? Yeah. So for me, this was a poem that I really I wanted to write. It was a time when I was really thinking about masculinity and what that meant. I was simultaneously going through puberty, having my first kiss, all of that stuff. And at the same time, I was also trying to analyze what all of that meant in this wider context of masculinity and of the patriarchy in our society. In many ways, I have saw points in my life where I really just felt these pressures trying to shape my identity as a young man and at some point succeeding. And it was something that really worried me, but also was something that just hadn't been talked about. And even for me, I grew up in a super open-minded household, went to a very progressive private school after being homeschooled. Like I still just felt so many pressures in society sort of trying to shape what masculinity meant for me. At the same time, there was a lot more attention being brought to sexual violence, sexual harassment, and sexual assault, and how a lot of that 
stemmed from issues of toxic masculinity. So that's what prompted me to try to sort of take this different approach to this idea of becoming a man. I had had this experience that I described where I was walking down a street because my high school baseball team was practicing at their field. And I remember there was a young woman in front of me and it wasn't clear what the reason was, but I just remembered that she like crossed over to the other side of the path after glancing back at me. And it was just this really striking moment. I felt perceived in a way that I'd never been perceived before. I saw how that was tied to my masculinity. And it was something that I knew I didn't represent. But at the same time, it was very clear that going back to the impact we have, just like I try to think about the impact of my words, what was the impact I had that day when I was walking? It was the impact of potentially making this young woman feel uncomfortable. It's recognizing that even if that's not the intention, if we are not actively supporting these systems, we are still complicit in them because it's just enforced in so many ways in our everyday life. So the reason that this poem versus others is really one that I think it's one that was really needed, that wasn't really out there in many forms. I felt like this sort of viewpoint of somebody in the middle of this transition from boyhood to manhood, but in this case, what it really means with that added component of masculinity and what that means in our society. I'd love for you to expand though, like, how do you judge whether or not something is a success? So far, you've talked in depth on why this was an honest piece in which you were the right person to share that story and put it out there. But then between that gap of creating something that you know to be right and that in your heart you want to express to the world to then having it being received and having it create the outcomes that you're trying to drive for, there is a gap there. And I'm wondering, how do you reconciliate with that? Do you design something differently? Do you launch it differently? I think a lot of it is in the writing and just the way you communicate things. It's really hard to measure the impact of something like spoken word poetry because it's something that actually could... Can I read another poem that... Like nobody has ever heard. Yeah, All right. please do. I'm, I'm down. We got to be special. All Love right. It. So this is, I'll just tell you sort of the inspiration for this, which is through my spoken word, it feels like so often, I'm sure you feel the same way. Any artist, anybody who sort of puts out passion driven work into the universe, it's so hard to have control over the impact it'll have. And any time that it seems like anybody's art does have impact, it basically ends up belonging to the world, so to speak. And I know that as artists, we still have you know, ownership over our work, but you don't have ownership over how it's portrayed, how it's picked apart and analyzed. And so that is what inspired this poem. I, I am, I am care... I am careful with my words because each time I speak, it feels like little people crawl out of my mouth to the tip of my tongue and then fall to an almost certain death. Is it intentional or a mere accident of breath? But every now and then with frequency bordering hope, a word like a phoenix from the saliva will rise. And for a moment, will pass before my eyes, before this child of mine becomes a child of the skies. That was it. Super short. But yeah, it's hard to analyze the impact or to try to control the impact. Because as that poem says, you know, anytime you put something out, especially in the form of words or art into the world that's meaningful, you really end up losing control over it. And it's scary because if you want your work to have any sort of impact, you really have to let it go. And it's up to the people who receive it, your audience, for how they interpret it and internalize it. Going back to the poem, Becoming a Man, the reason that I felt that could be a very impactful piece is because it's coming from your credible messenger in that I myself am a young man who in that poem admit my own complicity in the things that I'm trying to hold other men accountable for. I also reference a lot of experiences that I think other men can relate to, very personal experiences that are 
part of many people's growing up and their adolescence. Speaking to a room full of other young men, especially my own age, who are going off to college where they are likely going to be in environments where there is sexual harassment, potentially sexual assault, sexual violence, and they are given the opportunity to either respond in some way and try to hold their peers accountable for that or not. It comes from a very personal place of personal growth and personal realization versus standing on the sideline and telling somebody go from point A to point B when you haven't been to either point. It's being at point B and be like, hey, I was just over at point A. Come on over. (laughs) That's a great analogy. I love it. Nora, one of the other guest that we interviewed was talking about the importance of speaking in your own voice from your own experiences, because that's the voice that people trust and hear. And that truth really, really shines through and comes out. Because you're sort of a youth activist and a youth leader, and you organize protests and so forth with very different KPIs, have you ever thought of blending these two worlds together, the worlds of art and the world of social movement, and figure out a way how your art may help catalyze a movement or create measurable change or anything along those lines? Or are you determined to keep the two separate because you refuse to be a hero? That's a very interesting way of putting it. I don't see it as separate currently. I feel like it all works hand in hand. I tend to underestimate the power that art can have because it's often very intangible. But everything I do rooted in the same values It's my activism and my poetry works hand in hand just by default. Something I definitely think about a good bit, something that I want to find ways to be more innovative, aside from sharing spoken word at a rally or at a protest or doing a benefit concert or something. Really, really innovative ways of merging the two. Uh, And I haven't, to be honest, really found, I think, anything that hasn't been discovered yet. But that's definitely where my heart is at sort of the intersection of art and advocacy and politics. It's actually something that I've been exploring myself too. Like the purpose of these entire podcasts has actually been to try to figure out how to solve this issue. And what I've been feeling, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it, is that in order to measure impact, you want to start with a measurable environment. Mm. So figure out what the Mm -hmm. outcome you're going to want to accomplish is, whether that is let's say, a policy change or a certain number of voters to come out, you know, hypothetically, and then take those metrics and then create the symbol for people to rally around so that you can sort of claim credit for it. And while it's really, really hard to claim credit at a national or an international scale, if you shrink down the container small enough to a school or a district or a neighborhood and you begin there, then you can actually start observing the direct impacts from not just correlation, but actual causation and link it to a groundswell and tie it into a community. Yeah, I think that we oftentimes are in this mindset that we either have to focus on the immediate outcomes versus the long term. But I think that the only way you're able to really form a long term vision is by mapping out and realizing the steps to get there and focusing step by step. An example that comes to mind is this effort to rename my high school here in Atlanta. It's named after Henry Grady, who was a Reconstruction era journalist, but also avowed white supremacist and segregationist. I decided to work on that because a member of the Board of Education here in Atlanta spoke to me and said that she felt this was something board members might want to take action on, but only if there was support from students. And so seeing that I could really provide this very tangible role of cultivating support and dialogue is something I decided to take on, even though I really don't care about the name of my high school. I care about systemic racism, the criminal justice system, education, health care. And the plaque on the front of the high school here in Midtown Atlanta doesn't have anything directly to do with those things. But if we can use this conversation and dialogue as a tool to make strides on those issues, as an activist and an advocate, I just sort of see that as a tool. So I I decided to hone in on this goal. We got a petition going. We got some news agencies to cover it. We presented it to the board. 
a couple of weeks ago, I wrote an op-ed that sort of just brought attention back to it. And then the chair of our board of education tweeted that out and said, yeah, I support this. We're going to take action soon on it. And so even though I really don't give two shits about the name of my school, I see it as being a valuable step in furthering these other things I do care about. I see that conversation that sparked when we talk about the name of our school as being one that can lead directly into the conversation around these systems we need to change. Because Henry Grady was involved in creating these systems during Reconstruction when Black folks in Georgia were starting to gain some political power. He was one of the leaders who made sure that white Southern Democrats were able to come up with other forms of less explicit systemic racism post-slavery to quell any chance of a quick path to racial equality. Recognizing these connections, recognizing that the impact you want to have is probably not going to be tangible right away. When you hone in and look at what steps need to be taken to get to that end goal, you're going to have to pursue some efforts that isolated don't seem very impactful. But as long as they aren't isolated, as long as you do build on them, they can be impactful. I would never have taken any action around the name of my school if I wasn't already involved in so many other efforts around racial justice and around educational equity. I just saw that as a way to further the work that I was already engaged in and so many other people were already engaged in. You know, when I hear you talk about this renaming of the high school and how insignificant it is on one hand, but on how monumentally important it is on the other, I'm just wondering why there isn't a poem here to tell Mm -hmm. that story. In my mind, the power of your words, the reshare power of your words and the fact that it can be picked up years later, because when you tackle a systemic issue, it stays relevant for mm-hmm. as long as the, the, the system doesn't change, to me, feels like you could fast track this promise to change the name of the school in the future and actually blow it up from we're just changing the name to actually this is the first step of many that need to be happening. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good to hear. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, it's something that so far I just don't feel... Like I've figured, (laughs) no, it's that I just haven't, I don't feel like I've figured out a way of communicating that in a way that will be truly as as impactful as you say. I think it could be done. I just don't, I'd say check out the op-ed I wrote about it in the AJC if you want to, because that was my attempt to really connect how something this minuscule is one of the many reinforcements of systemic racism that we need to dismantle. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, though, no one reads yeah. op-eds on TikTok and no <laughs> no one on CNN reads op-eds and no one on Twitter yeah. re- reads op-eds. So it just, even if it was a short, you know, 45 second thing, I don't know. I, I think there's potential. I'd love to see you like blow it up, but that's just me being like really <laughs> excited about, about you and here fanboying a little bit. Appreciate but, it. Um, no, I, I think there's something really cool there. I guess I just want to end on one question then. You're so young, yet you've accomplished so much and you're so thoughtful. And I think counterintuitive to what me- most people would think of like Gen Z. If you had the ear of the world, what is one thing you would ask people to do or do differently? I feel that we collectively underestimate the power of words, especially in a time like this. It's really important to recognize that engaging with people is not at all endorsing them or agreeing with them or accepting any of their terms. I think that the thing that shows the most strength in one's values is being able to directly engage with somebody who disagrees and stay true to your values and defend them. That's something that unfortunately is sometimes seen as a weakness and is seen as giving in, even though talking to somebody is not giving anything in. I think one of the most powerful forms of action that you can take 
is being in environments where your point of view is going to be actively challenged and persevering. That's how you gain respect and you gain people's ears and attention. You know, most white folks are going to be in situations where they're around other white people that don't think the same way they do about race. And it's recognizing that if you do nothing and are fully complicit, then that's wrong. That is compromising your values but that if you're able to bring your values out and hold strongly to them, that is a show of strength. Thank you for sharing that. And on that note, if people want to engage you in dialogue, how should they find you? You can follow me on Instagram at Royce underscore the underscore man, R-O-I-C-E underscore the underscore man m-a-n-n also twitter the royce man facebook as well you can find a lot of my work on youtube spoken word feel free to reach out always love to engage folks in dialogues like the one we've had tonight amazing thank you so much royce for your time really appreciate it no problem thank you Alrighty, guys that was royce man r-o-y-c-e m-a-n-n You guys can find him online, listen to more of his poetry. It is all over the web. And as you've already heard, they are powerful. If you enjoyed this conversation, guys, make sure to go to impacteverywhere.org where you can find a summary along with graphics and shareable audiograms. I think conversations like these are super important. So if it resonated with you, make sure to share it out to your friends and family or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It makes a massive difference to the show. For next week, we bring on someone really special by the name of Jack Sim, also known as the world's number two man. And if you're wondering what number two is, well, he's the founder of the World Toilet Organization. And his mission in life, at least for the last couple of decades, has been to make sure that everyone gets access to clean sanitation. There's a documentary out on him right now on Amazon called Jack Sim, the world's number two man. And it's really, really funny and hilarious and will give you a lot of context for the conversation that we're going to have next week. I hope you guys are enjoying the journey so far. I know I certainly am because impact is everywhere.